Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Naresh Mahipal, a senior assistant professor from Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. I will deliver my lecture on the principles of marine insurance. This is my ninth lecture on insurance law. In my previous lectures, I have discussed about the historical development of insurance law globally as well as in Indian context. I have also discussed about the nature and scope of insurance contract. I have also discussed in detail regarding the principles which are guiding force for formation of any insurance contract. I have already discussed about the concept of life insurance policies. Then we have discussed about the premium, what are those factors, what are those variables going through which the underwriter writes a policy and fixes the premium amount and whether the policy should be accepted or rejected. There are certain guiding variables in that. I have already also discussed about the insurable risk. What are those risks which are insured by the insurers and what risks are not insurable by the insurers. I have started discussing marine insurance with discussing the concept of marine insurance. In my today's lecture, I will discuss the principles of marine insurance. We will discuss the principles in detail with the examples and at the appropriate time with the help of case laws. Then we will discuss the voyage policy. We will try to understand the voyage policy and those principles which are very important in a marine insurance policy such as your principle of utmost good faith, principle of insurable interest in marine policy, principle of indemnity, principle of subrogation and then we will try to understand the voyage policy. So, before discussing the important principles in marine insurance, introducing the marine insurance, we can say that it is commonly known that Indian courts previously followed English law principles and made decisions based on them as well as the English Act's provisions such as Marine Insurance Act 1906. Prior to the Indian Act 1963 entering into effect. Since Indian law is directly derived from its English counterpart. When in doubt, the real position should be ascertained by consulting case laws spanning more than two centuries. And those case laws that I am asking to refer are all mostly from English courts. Furthermore, because 
the marine insurance act is essentially a codification of earlier insurance law understanding earlier authorities earlier case laws is crucial for both comprehending concepts in general and for understanding specific situations now we will discuss the principles of marine insurance the insurance policies which are based which are formed following certain principles are very essential to discuss and it cannot run away from these certain principles because it is a contract between insured and the insurer and a contract as we know that it is guided by certain fixed set of principles at least fundamental principles should be observed and thereafter keeping into mind the specific or contractual principles for legalization of the marine insurance it should be contracted on the following principles number 1 the principle of utmost good faith that is juberima fights a marine insurance contract is based on the principle of utmost good faith that is a higher degree of honesty is required from both parties to an insurance contract this principle of utmost good faith has its historical roots in ocean marine insurance an ocean marine underwriter had to place great faith in statements made by the applicants for insurance concerning the cargo to be shipped thus we can say that the principle of utmost good faith imposes a high degree of honesty on both parties that is the insured and the insurers a contract of marine insurance is a contract based upon utmost good faith that is uberama fights and if the utmost good faith be not observed by either of the party to contract the contract may be avoided by other party let us take an example of good faith in marine insurance for example if mr ankur has brought hull insurance to safeguard his boat's hull he lied about the age of the ship to avoid paying a heavy premium amount when the insurance company learned of this the policy was cancelled because it was a breach of good faith on part of mr ankur so material fact should be disclosed by both parties especially by the insured a material fact is a fact which would affect the judgment of a prudent underwriter in considering whether he would enter into a contract or enter into it at one rate of premium or another and subject to what terms in other words we can say the material facts helps the underwriter to decide whether to enter into the contract with other party or not apart from the duty of disclosure the insured must act towards the insurer in good faith throughout the duration of the contract it is customary 
to classify breaches of the duty of at most good faith under four headings that is non disclosure concealment of the facts innocent misrepresentation and the fraudulent misrepresentations the first two are termed as passive breaches and the other two are termed active breaches the marine insurance act places a statutory duty on the assured to disclose to the insurer all material circumstances known to him or which he should know in the ordinary course of his business whether non disclosure is intentional or inadvertent the effect is the same and the policy may be avoided although deliberate and material non disclosure would usually amount to fraud and render the policy invalid second guiding principle is the principle of insurable interest the principle of insurable interest is another important legal principle the principle of insurable interest states that the insured must be in a position to lose financially if a loss occurs a valid contract of insurance can be entered into by a person only if has insurable interest in the subject matter of insurance that is if he is interested in marine adventure a person is interested in a marine adventure where he stands in any legal or equitable relationship to the adventure or to any insurable property at risk the marine insurance act contains a very clear definition of insurable interests it provides that there must be a physical object exposed to marine perils and that the insured must have some legal relationship to the object in consequence of which he benefits by its preservation and is prejudiced by loss or damage happening to it or where he has incur liability in respect thereof whereas in fire and accident insurance an insurable interest must exist both at inception of the contract and at the time of loss the interest in respect of a marine contract must exist at the time of loss though it may have not existed when the insurance was affected this is necessary when one considers the mercantile practice under which there is every possibility of sale and purchase of goods during transit however the marine insurance act has provided that where the goods are insured lost or not lost the assured may recover the loss although he may not have acquired his interest until after the loss unless at the time of effective insurance he was aware of the loss and the insurer was not third principle is principle of indemnity the principle of indemnity is one of the most important legal principle in marine insurance all insurance contracts except life insurance are contract of indemnity and are governed by section 124 of the indian contract act 1872 the laws caused to insured 
is covered by the contract itself and such loss need not necessarily be caused to the assured by the conduct of the insurer or by the conduct of any other person. To make it more clear, let us see some definition that has been provided in Marine Insurance Act. According to Marine Insurance Act, the indemnity that is provided is in manner and to the extent agreed. A commercial indemnity is thus provided because insurers cannot undertake to reinstate or replace cargo in the event of loss or damage. They pay a sum of money agreed in advance that will provide reasonable compensation. Let us make it clear with one more example that what is this principle of indemnity to say if Mr. Rakesh had purchased a cargo insurance policy with a rupees 10 lakh coverage. Now during the trip his goods sustained damage that cost rupees 5 lakhs to repair. Mr. Rakesh will only be indemnified to the extent of his damages that is rupees 5 lakh. He will not get the amount of rupees 10 lakh coverage. He will get what the actual loss has been sustained by him. He will only indemnified of that amount only. In practice, this is achieved by agreeing in advance the insured value. Based on CIF, value of the goods to which it is customary to add and agreed 10 percent which is intended to include the general overheads and perhaps a margin of profit on the transaction. Upon total loss of the entire cargo by an insured peril, the sum insured is paid in full and if part of the cargo is a total loss, the appropriate proportion of the insured value is paid. Furthermore, understanding the principle of indemnity, claims for damage are settled by ascertaining the percentage of depreciation and applying this percentage to the insured value. The percentage of depreciation is calculated by comparing the value the goods would realize in their damaged state with their gross sound value on the date of the sale. The same date is used for both values to avoid distortion of the result arising from fluctuation in the market prices. In marine insurance, it is customary to issue agreed value prices. The agreed value is conclusive between the insurer and the assured except in the event of the unintentional error or where the fraud is alleged. Duty and increased value policies are not agreed value policies. They provide pure indemnity only. Let us discuss few case laws on this aspect. In Dolby versus India and London Life Assurance Company 1854, it was observed that policies of assurance against both fire and marine risk are contracts of indemnity. The insurer engaging to make good within certain limited amounts, the losses sustained by the assured in the buildings, ships, and effects. In Castilian versus Preston 1883, it was observed that the insured will be indemnified 
to the extent he suffers loss. The insured will be indemnified to the extent he suffers loss. It would be against the public policy to allow an insured to make an income out of his loss or damage. So, after understanding the principle of indemnity, let us discuss about the principle of proximate cause that is also called as causa proxima and very important principle to determine the marine insurance policy. The doctrine of proximate cause is expressed in the maxim causa proxima non remota spectator which means that the proximate and not the remote cause shall be taken as the cause of loss. It lies down that the proximate cause that is the nearest cause is to be the basis of determining the liability of the insurer and not the remote cause will be taken into consideration. If the immediate risk is insured, the insured will be indemnified. It means that if the risk or cause of loss is not specifically covered under the policy, no compensation will be paid. Proximate cause means the active efficient cause that set in motion a train of events which brings about a result without the intervention of any force started and working actively from a new and independent source. Insurers are liable if an insured peril is the proximate cause of the loss. If an insured peril is only the remote cause of the loss, the proximate cause being an uninsured or expected peril, the insurers are not liable to pay anything for that. Proximate cause is not necessarily that which is proximate in time, but that which is proximate in efficiency. It is a dominant, effective and operative cause of the loss. In case of concurrent causes, there are certain rules which apply to each, which are a. If one of the causes contributing to the loss is an insured peril and no expected peril is involved, the loss is covered. B. If one of the causes is an expected peril, the loss is not covered at all unless the consequences of the insured peril can be separated from those of the uninsured peril in which event the former but not the latter one is covered. Very landmark judgment which must be mentioned here is Pink versus Fleming in 1840. The proximate cause has been clearly explained by the Queen's bench. Fact of the case was that the cargo was a shipment of oranges and the peril insured was the collusion with another ship. The ship was collided with another ship and resulted in delay and mishandling of shipment. It was held that the proximate cause for the loss was the delay and mishandling of shipment and not the collusion. So, insurer was not liable for damages as the peril insured was not the 
collision. So this case has been already discussed when we discuss the proximate principle. To make a marine insurer liable, the insured must prove three things. Number one, that the loss is caused by the perils of the sea. Secondly, that the peril is one that is insured against in the policy. And number three, that the perils insured is the proximate cause for the loss sustained. So, these are three things which should must be proved to get the insurance claims in marine insurance policies. Another principle is the principle of subrogation. This principle strongly supports the principle of indemnity. Subrogation means substitution of the insurer in place of the insured for the purpose of claiming indemnity from a third person for loss covered by the insurance. The insurer himself settles the claim from the third party. The insurer is therefore entitled to recover from a negligent third party any loss or the payments that is made to the insured. Once the insured is compensated, the insurer stands in the place of him and inherits all the rights available to him against the third party regarding subject matter of the insurance. Subrogation is the right which one person has of standing in place of another and availing himself of all the rights and remedies of other whether already enforced or not. Subrogation is a corollary of the principle of indemnity and the right of subrogation therefore applies to policies which are contracts of indemnity. Subrogation is a matter of equity the purpose of which is to ensure that the insurer is not over indemnified for the same cause. Let us make this principle of subrogation more clear with an example. To take an example in marine insurance, suppose that Mr. Sam, a trader, purchased a cargo insurance policy from an insurance provider. Due to some ship owner negligence, his cargo was ruined. In that situation, Mr. Sam will receive the claim amount from the insurance company, which will then take ownership of the damaged property after paying the claim amount to the insured. With its new ownership, the business is able to sue the ship owner and get damages. So, the insurer company stands into the place of insured person. In marine insurance, where an insurer pays for a total loss, is entitled to take over the interest of the insured in whatever may remain of the subject matter so paid for that you can see that is abandoned property and he is subrogated to all the rights and remedies of the assured as from the time of the loss. Where an insurer pays for a partial loss, he acquires no title in the subject matter insured or to such part of it as may remain, but he is subrogated to all the rights and remedies of the assured 
as from the time of loss and in so far as the assured has been indemnified. In marine insurance, subrogation applies only after the payment of loss. The insurer is entitled to recover only up to the amount which he has paid in respect of rights and remedies. And on payment of a total loss, the insurer is entitled to assume rights of ownership of the subject matter insured. The right is conferred upon him by amendment and the effect is that if the property is subsequently salvaged or recovered, the insurer is entitled to retain the whole of the proceeds of the sale even though they may exceed the sum paid out under the policy always assuming the property is fully insured and that the assured was not bearing part of the risk himself. In addition to this right of exercising ownership over the property, the insurer is subrogated to all the rights and remedies of the assured as from the time of casualty causing the loss. This simply means that if the loss has been caused by the negligence of a third party against whom the assured has a right of action in torts, say against a carrier or belly, then the insurer is entitled to succeed to any recovery the assured may affect from such third party because now the insurer is in the foots of insured. This principle applies equally to total and partial loss and has nothing whatever to do with the doctrine of amendment. To discuss case laws, in Hobbes versus Marlowe 1978, it was held that right of subrogation may be exercised by the insurer against the third party before payment of loss. It has the right to control over any such proceedings. In Mason versus Sainsbury 1782, Lord Mansfield observed that every day the insurer is put into the place of insured. In Rendell versus Cochrane 1748, it was held that the plaintiff insurers after making satisfaction stood in the place of assured as to in proportion for what they had paid. In Burnant versus Rodokanji 1782, Lord Blackburn observed that if the indemnifier that is the insurer has already paid it, then if anything which diminishes the loss comes into the hand of the person that is the insured to whom he has paid it, it becomes an equity that the person who has already paid the full DMT is entitled to be recouped by having that amount back. If the amounts get into the hand of the insured, insurer is entitled to get it back from the insured because it has been already paid by the insurer to the insured. This concept of subrogation is recognized by Indian law by which the insurer is entitled to pursue recoveries in respect of losses suffered by the insured that the insurer has indemnified. This right arises pursuant to both statute and case law. As for statute, the Marin Insurance Act 1963, specifically section 79 is relevant to it. There are numerous case laws dealing with the subrogation of which we have already discussed also and one more case that we can consider is Economic Transport Organization versus Charan Spinning Mills Private Limited 
2010 and this decision is very prominent in indian context the constitutional bench of supreme court explained that subrogation is inherent incidental and collateral to a contract of indemnity which occurs automatically when the insurer settles the claim under the policy by reimbursing the loss suffered by the insured so this is a automatic procedure as soon as the insurer satisfies the loss sustained by the insured it stands into the footing of the insured next principle is principle of contribution sometimes one risk may be covered by more than one insurer maybe you are having many insurance policies for a single occasion or a single product in that case it is not desirable only to ensure that the insured does not receive more than an indemnity but that any loss is fairly spread between all the insurers involved if you are insured for 10 lakh by five insurance companies and the loss is actual 5 lakh you will be indemnified by for 5 lakh rupees only by all the insurers you will not get much from the insurance companies the principle of contribution is a method of distributing fairly among insurers the burden of claims for each shares some responsibility so this is the responsibility which has been shared by the insurance companies and this is the principle of contribution let us take it an example to make it more clear in maritime insurance if we say that mr ram paid rupees 5 lakhs a piece to two cargo insurance policies from two distinct insurance providers regretfully mr ram suffers damages of rupees 5 lakh when his shipment is damaged at the port now mr ram approaches the first insurance provider he receives the whole rupees 5 lakh claim payment from the first insurance company since the second insurance company also consented to share the risk the first insurance company will now file a claim of rupees 2.5 lakh under the principle of contribution with the second insurance company in the case if the first insurance company has paid you the loss and both companies has agreed to share the loss in that situation the first company will file the claim to the second insurance company in proportion to that so following factors are required to exist before a loss is shared among the insurers that is there must be at least two policies of insurance all insurances must be policies of indemnity that is the indemn to indemnify the loss the policies must cover the same interest the same subject matter and the same peril means there are two or more policies for the same subject matter or the same peril contract of marine insurance is an agreement whereby the insurer undertakes to indemnify the insured in the manner and to the extent thereby agreed against transit losses losses incidental to transit a contract of marine insurance may by its express terms or by usage of trade be extended to protect the insured against losses on inland waters or any land risk which may be incidental to any sea voyage in simple words the marine insurance includes number 1 cargo insurance which provides insurance cover in respect of loss or damage to goods during transit by rail roads sea air etc or export and import shipments by ocean going vessels of all types and the 
coastal shipments by steamers, sailing vessels, merchandising boats, etc., and shipments by inland vessels or country crafts, and consignments by railroad or airs and articles sent by post. Secondly, the hull insurance which is concerned with the insurance of ships that is the hulls and the machineries etc. This is a highly technical subject and is not dealt in this particular module in details. Simply speaking, this part of marine insurance which is called hull insurance is dealing with the insurance of ships, barges, launches, boats and offshore installations. So, these are certain principles which are essential to understand how the marine insurance policies are formed. These principles helps the underwriters to grow through certain aspects go through certain principles before the formation of any marine insurance contracts. Now, what is the procedure to ensure the marine insurance, to get the marine insurance policies? The very first one is submission of form, second is quotation from the insurance company, third is payment of premium and fourth one is issue of cover note or to say the policy. We will discuss it one by one. So, these four things are essential. We can say that this is the procedure to ensure under marine insurance. The very first thing is about the submission of a form. The details which will be on the form that you are submitting to get a marine insurance policy are the shippers or consignors name. Shippers means the insured person or the consigner is the insured person. Your name on that particular form. Second is detailed explanation of the items to be covered. That what insured wants to get covered. The type of commodity that needs to be insured matters for underwriting and rating. Different commodities are vulnerable to different kinds of damages while in transit. Cotton is prone to fire, liquid cargoes are vulnerable to leaks and broken glasswares etc. Electronic goods are vulnerable to theft and so on. Sugar, cement and other similar commodities are easily damaged by sea water. So, there should be a detailed explanation of the items to be covered in your submission of the form. Another thing that is important while submitting the form is method and type of packing. You need to mention it. The possibility of loss or damage depends on this factor that what care has been taken at the end of insured. Generally, goods are packed in bales or bags, cases, bundles, crates, drums or barrels. Loose packing, paper or cardboard cartons or in the bulks etc. So, it should be very clearly mentioned in the submission of form that what is your method of or the type of packing. It will help the underwriter to determine whether to enter into any insurance contract with you or not. You need to mention also that what is the journey route and what is the mode of transportation. That is to say the location of the starting and ending place of the transit. What will be your route at that time? 
the mode of conveyance that is whether to carry goods by truck train aeroplane or by combination of two or more of these to be employed in the process means how the product will be carried to the ship and when the ship delivers it how it will be taken to the destination when a voyage abroad is involved the name of the vessel must be disclosed that in which ship you wants to send your good that must be mentioned the risk is increased if a voyage is anticipated to involve a transshipment it is important to keep this in mind when looking for insurance the term transshipment refers to switching carriers while traveling also it is necessary to identify the risks that insurance coverage is needed for the specifics of the hazards are covered later in this chapter as well second important thing is about the quotation by insurance company the insurance company will issue a premium rate quotation based on the information supplied in your form whatever information you are supplying in the form it will help the insurer to calculate the premium amount in summary there are factors which affect the premium rates are commodity nature that what is your article is it glass is it a cement bag it will determine the premium amount what is the packing technique is it kept in open or is it properly sealed the ship which ship you wants to take into account while transferring the articles because the quality of the ships the company background everything is kept into mind by the insurer to determine the premium amount and the kind of insurance contract what type of contracts you want to get it that is principle of subrogation will apply principle of contribution will apply or the principle of indemnity will apply it will be decided on the kind of insurance contract you are entering up another important aspect of entering into an marine insurance contract is payment of the premium on accepting the premium rates the concerned person will make the payment of the insurance company the payment can be made on the consignment basis another important factor is issuance of cover note or to say the policy document cover note means a cover note is a document that provides coverage in the interim until a regular policy is issued it commonly occurs that not all the information needed to issue a policy is available for example it might not be known the steamer's name the quantity of packages in transit the date and number of the railway receipts etc the contract for marine insurance is evidenced by marine policy document it includes personal informations like the insured's name specifics of the products etc these were previously recognized the risk covered are mentioned in detail in the insurance that what type of risks are to be covered in the voyage specific coverage is a type of insurance that covers a single shipment or consignment there is one more policy that is open policy or floating policy it is another term given for an open policy 
it is given to handle all shipments falling under its purview and is worded broadly it is granted for a sizable sum to finance shipping or sending over a specific time frame under the open policy declarations are made and these lower the total amount of insurance your declarations in your the form will also determine the premium amount typically open policies are offered for a year a new policy may be issued or the original policy may have an endorsement added for the increased amount if they are completely declared prior to that time on the other hand if the policy is cancelled after its regular term has passed and the full payment has been previously collected the insured receives a proportionate premium return on the unused amount every declaration is received and accompanied by a unique insurance certificate since an open policy is a stamped document the insurance certificates issued under it does not need to be stamped inland shipments are typically covered by open policies there are certain advantages of an open policy compared to specific policies regarding the open cover large export and import companies that ship frequently would find it quite hard to get insurance coverage separately for each cargo this is where an open covers come in handy it is also possible that insured shipment may go uninsured due to an oversight on the insured's part in this case the insured would be responsible for paying any losses that may occur an open cover automatically handles all shipments that fall under its purview and provides a general description of the contents trips and covers etc so there are some important features of an open policy or to say open cover that is limit per bottom or per conveyance second one is basis of valuation and third is location clause so these are very important for the open cover policies fourth one is rate and fifth one is terms certain products protected by open cover may be subject to other terms which are expressly stated another one is declaration clause and there should be a cancellation clause this clause provides for cancellation of the contract with a certain period of notice for example a month's notice on either side in case of war and srcc risks the period of risk is much short then there is a certificate of insurance once the initial policy has been properly stamped certificates do not need to be stamped when products are transported by an authorized method they fall within the purview of marine insurance it is possible to transport the items both inside and outside the nation any form of transportation has some risk and marine insurance is designed to protect against these losses the type of goods and packaging determines the risk coverage and a premium must be paid in order to cover the risk what are the types of marine losses it may be classified into total loss actual presumed total loss and constructive total loss total loss actual is when the assured is irretrievably deprived of the subject matter or when it is destroyed or so damaged as to no longer be what it was originally insured as actual total loss occurs and second one is presumed total loss it means that after a sufficient amount of time pass it may be assumed that 
the ship involved in the adventure has completely disappeared. In that situation, presumed total loss comes into existence. And then the third one is constructive total loss. This happens when the subject matter is logically abundant because it seems that its actual total loss cannot be avoided or because preserving it from actual total loss would require spending more money than it would be worth once the expenditure was made. In this constructive total loss, insured may choose a partial loss or to give up the subject matter to the underwriters and file a claim for entire loss in the event of a constructive total loss. Now let us understand the voyage policy. There are some conditions that is the implied conditions as to the commencement of risk. It has been given under section 44 of the act and then there is alteration of port of departure. Section 45 makes provisions for it and under section 46 you will get all the information relating to the sailing for different destinations and if there is a change in voyage the rules the law has been provided under section 47 and if you deviate from the route section 48 comes into play and if there are several ports of discharge section 49 of the merit marine insurance act provides for the provisions and if there is a delay in voyage section 50 deals with that that during policy voyage the adventure insured must be prosecuted through throughout its course without any delay and section 51 it deals with the excuse for deviation and delay so it can be said that a voyage policy is an insurance policy specifically a marine insurance policy provides coverage due to unforeseen risk to cargo that is being transported by ship for example earthquake lightning fire and collision etc so in the nutshell we can say that we have discussed in this module about the principles of marine insurance and such as your principle of utmost good faith principle of insurable interest principle of indemnity principle of subrogation principle of contribution and then we have discussed what documents are required to make a claim and lastly we have discussed about the voyage policy we have tried to understand the voyage policy various sections of the marine insurance act deals with the voyage policy such as delay such as deviation from the route such as any other reasonable excuses which can be made which are unforeseen during those voyage those are coverage by the sections of the marine insurance act i am hopeful that lecture was beneficial to you to understand the concept of marine insurance Thank you to all of you.